Hey guys, Joe Pye here with Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. You know, I had someone ask me a pretty good question uh, in my comment line on some of my other videos, and I just dusted across it and gave a pretty generic answer. And then I really started to think, well, what if you don't have digital readouts on your machines and CNCs and adjustable chucks? And some of the comments that I'm getting are really making me think, so keep them coming. This one goes out to Billy T. Billy T wanted to know how to find center of a piece of round stock with an edge finder and I said well this can't be all that hard to find one side find the other side split the difference and then uh, do the same lather rinse and repeat cake right well you know it's not if you don't have a digital readout on your machine this can be relatively tricky and you're not going to pick up a true center to center center to center across the diameter reading with an edge finder when you indicate or when you edge find a piece of round stock and let me show you what I mean so thanks Billy thanks for the question it was a good question let me put my eyeballs on here so I can see all right here's your part see how round we can make this look that's not bad there's your center that you're looking for Right. Now when you position your edge finder to do this initially, you got to start somewhere. So just get it close to where you think the center is. It doesn't have to be on center. It does not have to be on center. So when you bring your edge finder in and you make contact with your part and it kicks out, note where you're at, zero your dial, whatever you have to do. But now you have a point right here. You don't even have to split the contact uh, diameter of your edge finder in half for this. Just record it. Pick it up and move over here. Okay, you have this distance now because you just found that distance. Now you're worried about it being on center? It doesn't matter if you're on center because you have distance from here to here. And if you know what that distance is, well, you split it. And now, when you come in to find this axis, now you're on center. So when you solve for an edge finder on a round piece, the first piece you're going to pick up is going to be a chord of a circle. Not a quarter, a chord. A segmented section of the circle, not across the diameter. And then the second leg you're going to pick up will be across the diameter. So it's going to be basically a cross. First one is a short leg, split it. Second one should be right over the center. And once you find this dimension out, then you can find this. Now, if you have a digital readout on your machine, this is not a problem because you watch the edge finder kick out, you zero, you come over here, you slide it back, you watch for it to kick out, you record the value, x, 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 x. Some of these digitals have a split the difference or center line of or midpoint, so you hit midpoint you hit the axis and it gives you this value here shift over do this leg not a problem but think about this your edge finder here is the one that's sitting still although it looks like it's coming for your part the parts actually coming for the edge finder so when you pick this side up the part is moving in this direction moving 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 kicks out great got it record the number Okay, when you, put the end of, when you put the edge finder on this side, you, now you're pulling the part into it. So now the part is moving this way. And guess what? Ba 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 ba. Mr. Backlash is in there. So you're wondering, okay, well, you can't do both sides in the same direction. How do we do this? How do you know what to do? Well, this dead zone right here, the backlash zone, is a value that's probably pretty solid on your machine. And if you know what this is, you can factor it into the dimensions that show up on your dials. Now this gets kind of uh, iffy, and if I really wanted to find the center of a piece of round stock, I wouldn't be using an edge finder. So if you guys have made the investment in your tools, in your shop, in your machinery, and you're getting serious about this, you gotta go get a dial indicator, okay? Bite the bullet. Buy a good one, brown and sharp, stare it, Mitutoyo, whatever you can find. Buy a name brand, treat it like the Paris Hilton of your toolbox. 
It's got to be put away at night. You can't keep it near a belt sander or anything. You keep it clean, keep it pristine. Put it away when you're done using it. Make the investment because if you're going to do stuff like this, if you're going to pick up holes, if you're going to pick up diameters, it's a whole lot easier with a dial indicator, in my opinion, if you don't have a digital readout. And a dial indicator is a whole lot cheaper than buying a digital readout. Okay, so those are the mechanics. Get close to center, pick up one side, pick up the other side. Now I am going to go over what to do with Mr. Backlash here so that everything, the lights go on and everything's perfectly clear. Okay, left side, right side, center, front, rear, your home. But if you had an indicator, it would be better. All right, let's talk about Backlash. It's a term that everybody hears and I just assume that everybody knows what it is, but maybe you don't, I don't know. So let's put it up on the board and show you exactly what it is. Underneath your table, in both directions, X and Y, you have a big piece of Acme rod. And as you turn your dial, on my mill it's 200 per revolution, five equals an inch, that rotates. It doesn't move, but it rotates. So let's do a cross section up here. Uh, real primitive. Close enough. Here's the center of the, the rod. Now as you turn that, these move naturally because it's a thread. It's like an elevator. If, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you. Take a look at this. Okay, now you know what that looks like. These are constantly shifting back and forth as you turn that wheel. It's not that the wheel doesn't turn the screw, it's that the screw has a moment of, of air before it makes contact with the other side. So this is the screw. Now this usually rests inside of a, a bronze nut or a brass nut or whatever inside each of the tables because if it was steel, it would wear out really quick. So they make it out of something that does wear. And it's like this. Here's your nut. All right, there's your nut. So which way would this be going? The nut is on the table. So let's say this is the table. I would say in this example, we have contact, which means the table is being pushed that way. Now when you reverse the rotation of your screw, the screw has to move over here before it makes contact with that other side of that nut and moves the table this way. Well this little distance right here is what causes the backlash. When you turn that dial and it feels like there's nobody home for, I don't know, 30, 40 thou or 18 thou or whatever you got dialed in, that's because there is nobody home. This thing is moving dead air. The table's just sitting there waiting for something to happen, and when the screw's moving over and makes contact, boom, now you have it. So what you have to do is go out to your machine and figure out what this is, because it's going to be constant. It's a surface-to-surface -surface contact one way, surface-to-surface -surface contact the other way. And I think without this value right there, picking up the true center of a round part of stock with an edge finder, it's not going to be possible. So let's take a look on how to do that. It's really not all that hard, provided you have some type of indicator. All right, guys, here's the setup. I have a drop indicator, has a stroke of one inch on it, on an adjustable base. You could use a mag base, you could use a block with a C-clamp, I don't care what you use. But you got to get your indicator up against the x-axis table and bring it to zero at the same time you bring your dial to zero. Now, I don't know if the camera has sufficient range to actually see this down here, but we want these zeros to coincide at the same time. So I'm going to go counterclockwise with my y-axis dial.
and I am going to go clockwise until that drop indicator hits a zero. All right. Now with the drop indicator on zero, with the y-axis dial clockwise on zero, and I can uh, tell you that my digital readout is looking at zero, we have a relatively good starting point for this exercise. All right. Now go beyond your zero clockwise with your dial. About 30, 40 thou, it doesn't matter. I would say, uh, let's go at least 50 thou. I don't know how worn out some of these machines are out there, but let's go 50 thou. Now on the way back, my dial goes about 18 thousandths before I feel resistance. So I'm going to turn my dial counterclockwise now until the indicator comes back around to zero. Okay, now counterclockwise, I am now reading 181 on my dial. And since my dials are 200 thou per revolution, this is a 19 thousandths backlash on my Y axis. So I'm just going to write that right directly on the top of my chuck over here. I'm going to say Y.019 backlash BL. Okay, let's try it again and see if it repeats. Clockwise, zero on the dial, zero on the drop indicator, zero on my digital readout. I am going to push the table continuously clockwise with the y-axis crank. Now I am reversing the y-axis crank counterclockwise, coming back looking for zero. All right, I got 19 again on my dial. 181. I have zero on my digital readout. I can trust that my y-axis backlash value is 19, but it's 19 today. It doesn't mean it's going to be 19 five years from now. So depending on how much exercise your machine gets, how often you oil it, how often you clean it, uh, whether or not you've had an earthquake or a tsunami, check this once in a while and make sure that this is staying straight. Uh, if you have a technician that can come in, some of these are adjustable, some are not. You have to actually replace the nut to get that out of there, but some of these are adjustable, so if you can adjust it and keep it tight, wonderful. But don't keep it so tight that it causes friction in both directions and wears out. So the backlash does afford a little bit of uh, convenience that way. Now the x-axis is done exactly the same way, but you're going to have to secure your indicator in your collet somehow or use a different style of indicator. Let me show you what that looks like, and I'll show you a nifty little attachment that you should buy as well. All right, guys, this little attachment here is called an Indicol. I-N-D-I-C-O-L. And this is one of the most versatile little attachments you can possibly ever consider buying. And they're not all that expensive either. It's just a simple seat type clamp down here with a little lead screw that comes in and out. You can put this on a drill chuck. But what I like about it is it fits right here on the quill. And boy, when you're sweeping a hole, there's nothing better than to have something that just absolutely makes life easy. This is a brown and sharp best test indicator. About a 30 thou range on it in half thou increments. There's a dovetail on the back, there's a do or excuse me, that's the top, dovetail on the back, and there's a dovetail on the front. So it affords you a variety of different clamping positions. Now this little guy here is where the dovetail bites onto. And you can see how easy that would be for indicating something round. It truly is a blessing. But let's do the x-axis exercise here. by just using the vice jaw. I'm going to reposition the camera for a second, so hang in there. Okay, forgive the angle of the camera. If it were straight on, it would be in my way. So I am bringing the table over right now. I am cranking the x-axis from the right side handle. I'm cranking it clockwise. And I'm looking for zero. Here we go. Zero. All right, I am going to zero the dial 
on this side crank. And just for my own purposes, I am going to zero my digital readout, which is off camera. All right, counterclockwise backing off. I'm going to check that the indicator and the dial coincide at zero at the same time. All right, we have zero. Now with this one, with a 30 thou indicator, 15 either way, you can't go 50 thousands past or you're going to end up with the real problem. So let's take it as far as you can. I'm going to take it to 15. And now I'm going to turn my x-axis crank on the right side of the table counterclockwise until that needle comes back around to zero. Now if you see it's starting to sputter, I'm tapping on the dial with my finger ever so gently. Alright, I have 33 thou showing on my dial right now. I am sitting on 167. So by higher math, that's a 33 thou backlash on the x-axis. I'm going to confirm that by repeating the exercise I just did. I'm going to continue to turn this dial counterclockwise. Now I'm going to turn it clockwise and look for the zero to come back around on the indicator. And my dial on my table is zero right now, so clockwise at zero. I'm going to continue to turn the table dial clockwise. This is arbitrary. It could be 10 thou, it could be 15, it could be 5, whatever. But just get past your zero. Now I'm going to start to turn counterclockwise again. I'm coming back for the zero. I'm sorry if this is redundant, but you got to do this once in a while. Okay, we're on zero. We are back on 167. I'm not sure what I said before, but we're on 167 this time. 33 thou on the X, and I am going to write that down. X. O33. And the Y. 19. All right, let's take these values back inside to the board and I'll show you how to apply them. Hey guys, here's a handy little trick for you. Once you find a location on your part or on your table that you like, put a couple pieces of masking tape, one on the bed, one on the crust. Line them up, put some index marks on them with a Sharpie marker and write your little zeros. My note right there, RSCW, means right side dial, turning clockwise, this was zero, zero. Handy little tip. Okay guys, I'm going to snap my indicator on my spindle and I am going to zero out this part. And for those of you that are paying attention, I changed the diameter of the material in the machine to a one inch. Just so I can validate the numbers that I get and probably better illustrate what's happening with the backlash. When I start this process, I never make contact with the part initially. I always keep the indicator above. You can see that the gap on this side is about a quarter of an inch, and the gap on this side is almost non-existent. So I'll come over here and move it to about an eighth of an inch. Look for about the same on the opposite side, and I'll do the front and the back the same way. As soon as I'm happy that we have a relatively consistent gap, I'll bring my indicator down and make contact with the part. Now sometimes when you're looking at an indicator spin, if you're looking at it through a mirror or as it rotates, you're not sure what side of the zero that I was on, pay attention to the text on the dial. Since this one says brown and sharp, and the indicator is positioned towards me right now, I can see that the needle is a half a thousandth on the brown side, the word brown. So when it spins around the back, if something were to happen and all of a sudden it's a half a thou on the other side, I said no, it's half a thou on the sharp side. So now I'm going to make it go to zero. 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 And zero.
zero. Now if you see the needle moving around, there's irregularities on the outside of this material, but as long as you have the four points, you got it going. I'm going to zero out my digital as well, so when I start the edge finder work, we have something to relate to. All right, I like it. Before you start your edge finder work, unlock the locking rings that secure the dials on your X and Y cranks. If they're really tight, like I like to make mine, when it comes time to unloosen them, you could have a potential to shift the location of your table and mess things up. So loosen them up before you start your edge finding. This machine is going to make some noise and drown out this camera, so I'm going to walk you through this first time with this turned off, and then I'll do it second time with the motor turned on. Uh, may or may not be on camera, but I'm going to walk you through it. Now we're not going to start over the center of the part. Just going to eyeball it and move off. Right now I know by my digital, I'm 72 thousandths off center on my Y. Move your edge finder over to the opposite side of your part and dial it in until it kicks out like you were indicating a piece of square stock. At this time, zero your right hand dial. Back it off, force the edge finder to jump around, get close to your part, watch for it to kick out. When it kicks out, double check your dial and make sure that your dial is on zero. Okay, and if you remember that little hint about the tape on the table with the zero zero, if you're going to do that, now would be a good time to do it. So that's what I'm going to do. I don't know if you can see me doing it down here, but I'm putting it on the table right now. Now you just repeat this process for the other side of the part. Lift it up, move it over. Now this is where the backlash calculation is going to come in because this crank is going in the opposite direction. You are no longer pushing the part into the edge finder, you're pulling the part into the edge finder. So there is a difference and these numbers will come into play. So roll it over here until it kicks out. Record the number on your dial. Do it again. Kick it out, move it over until the edge finder jumps. Look at the number for the same number. Get up off the part. I've never been a big fan of leaving an edge finder on a part while it's kicking out. I just don't think it's good for the edge finder uh, integrity, the, the sliding surfaces, or the location diameters. So get it up off the part once you're happy with your reading. Once you have your numbers here, you're going to split the difference. And like I showed you on the board, this is not across the true diameter of the part, but you are finding the center of that leg that you just determined. So as soon as you're happy that you're on center now, repeat the same exact thing in the back. Push it in until it kicks out. Zero your dial. Get off your part. Kick it off center again. Move back in. Watch for it to jump. Confirm that the dial is now on zero. If you can put another piece of tape on your machine, put an index mark with a Sharpie marker, crayon, lipstick, whatever. Remember where you started. Lift it up off the part. This is where the y-axis backlash is going to come into play. You are now pulling into the edge finder instead of pushing into it, so there is a difference. Make contact with the part. Look for it to kick out. Record your number. Get off the part. Give it a kick with your finger and repeat. When the edge finder jumps off center again because you're making ideal contact, record that number. I'm going to do this for real, and I'm going to record everything that happens. So if it's uh, too long, I'm going to accelerate the footage, but I'm going to cross-reference everything I'm about to tell you when it slows down against the digital readout with a very good explanation of how to apply these every time.
All right, guys, well, that was quite an exercise. And I'll tell you, once you have a digital readout, you kind of get lazy and you forget about these grassroots skills. So, Billy T., excellent question. You actually got my brain going, and I lost some sleep last night over this because I really didn't have an answer. If somebody would have said, okay, right now, $64,000, question, which, what do you do? I, I would have said, well, you know, don't let the backlash get you, which is exactly what I said, which is why I'm posting this video because it bothered me that I said that. All right. The magic answer, the, the answer to the question, right here. This is how it goes. We're going to use big drawing, we're going to use big numbers, and everybody's going to know exactly what to do. Now, you saw how to derive the backlash values. And I would have to say, at best, finding the center of a piece of round stock with an edge finder is okay. If you have a digital readout, you can probably trust it. If you do not have a digital readout, I would say it's going to be within a couple thou, but it's not going to be nearly as close as if you trammed it with a dial indicator. So go buy that dial indicator. All right, here's the exercise. You have a one inch diameter part. You're using a 200 thou diameter edge finder. Let's just say you are right over the center this time. This is your x-axis leg. We know what it's going to be center to center. It's going to be 1 inch plus radius plus radius. It's going to be 1 inch 200. Now if you were cranking the table to move from here to here, you're going to end up on zero, right? If your dials are 200 thou per, it's going to be six full cranks of the table to move it over here. So it would be two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. You're there. But since this side is pulling, there goes the backlash until you get your number. Now, when you hit that number, pulling your part, you're going to have a number that's less than this because of that backlash value is going to be backed out of the actual 1.2 or whatever calculated size you're looking for or come up with, it's going to be a smaller reading because you've used the backlash against this side and come up with a, a value that means something, but you need to add the backlash number in. So let's say you have 50 thou worth of backlash. You're going to have zero on your dial here. You're going to go crank an edge finder across, crank the part underneath the edge finder. In a clockwise manner, you're going to be counting up, I believe. So when you get to the other side and you start to back it off, you're going to have 150 on this side, plus your 50 thou backlash is going to give you zero, zero. All right. So the backlash value must be added to whatever you come up with in order to give you a good number to split in half to find this center. And boy, I hope I said that right. If anybody wants to challenge this, feel free to challenge it. But do yourself a favor. If you have a digital readout, tram your part, zero everything, and then do this with an edge finder. It's a great exercise. It's something I haven't done in years. So, Billy, thank you for, for putting the question out there. Uh, before I go, I got to show you something that I got the other day. Everybody likes to show their stuff off. Well, I got something from my oldest daughter, Jackie. And if you guys are mechanical, and obviously you are because you have a machine shop in your garage, then you probably played with Legos as a kid or play with your kids' Legos or whatever, but you know that they exist. The Lego franchise has made full-length feature films, Lego movies, and it's a big hit in our house. I mean, even as college kids and even as adults, you're going to have to enjoy the animation and the story, and it's just cool to see. Well, with my birthday just having passed, I don't know how my daughter managed to pull this off, but I am now immortalized as a Lego man. She got me made as a Lego guy. So check this out. Kind of scary, isn't it? Captain America, 
And I tell you, I'm going to cherish this little thing. This is awesome. Like, and, well, everything is awesome, right? You'll see that in the movie, too, if you watch it. Anyway, I digress. That was a birthday present from my daughter. Jackie, thank you. That was a great present. Made me smile and will make me smile for a long time. Anyway, I hope this was clear because I'm going to be chewing on it for a while because it's really still not all that clear to me. But add the backlash into the values, whichever X, Y value you come up with. Add it in. Split it. You'll find the center. Go buy an indicator. It's going to put all this out to pasture, and you won't ever have to worry about it again. Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out.